Hi. Hi. Um, Morning. Theatre, certainly. Um, what did you make of it? I thought that in the arraignment proceedings, he looked subdued and genuinely worried about what was happening. Um, and he's never actually had to face this before. And I thought it was, uh, it was a side of Donald Trump you don't often see. He looked a bit vulnerable then. I thought in front of his audience of supporters at Mar-a-Lago, you saw classic Trump. He feeds off the energy of his supporters and he was out there at his bombastic best or worst, depending on your viewpoint. Some of his comments um, were quite obviously um, uh, not true, shall we say, at, mm. at best. Um, do you think he knows that when he says what he says? I honestly think that he has in his head a sort of alternative version of reality. I don't think he thinks that the truth is a single point of light in a dark sky. I think he thinks there's a range of options for the truth in any case, and he will always choose the one that is favourable to him. So I don't think he ever believes that he is he is deliberately um, deliberately uh, lying to people. I think he just thinks that it's uh, you know it's a it's a reality that uh, that stands up in his own mind and should stand up in the minds of others. Was there anything that particularly stood out from the speech for you? Not really. Um, I mean, I thought he had a slightly different line from saying his usual stuff about a witch hunt to saying this was interference in the election process. So he's, you know, he wanted something new to say to his supporters last night, and that was slightly new. But it's the same line, essentially, that he is being victimised. It's the line his lawyers took outside the courtroom yesterday, which is that if it were not for it being Donald Day Trump, um, you know, on the stand, these, these, this, this arraignment, this case would never have been brought. He did also, I mean, just talk, talking about uh, the wider politics, and then we'll, we'll drill down a little bit further, he was talking about what was happening with China, with uh, Iran, uh, with Russia, um, and also talked about Ukraine, saying that wouldn't have happened if he'd been president. Yeah, I mean, the Ukraine point, that's stretching it, frankly. What we remember about Donald Trump as president was him always talking about what a great relationship he had with Vladimir Putin. Um, which about is true. Which, up to a point, is true. Up to a point. You never really knew what Putin thought about Trump. Um, and remember, he sided with Putin on there having been no evidence of, of Russian interference in the elections against his own security authorities, who said they had. So it was a very strange relationship with Putin. And he didn't want to see the Ukrainian president unless the Ukrainians would try and dig up some dirt on Hunter Biden. So I think his record on Ukraine is pretty mixed. Remember the day of the invasion, um, February last year, his first reaction was that it was something like, it was a genius move by Vladimir Putin. Um, he corrected himself a bit later, but that was his first reaction. That's always quite telling. So the idea that Donald Trump can come in and resolve Ukraine in 24 hours, I think is pretty far-fetched. How much of a tightrope is he walking uh, by criticising openly the judge and the district attorney? Uh, given what was said in the courtroom yesterday, I thought he might at least back off on that. And he didn't in his speech in Malaga. Maybe the occasion, you know, he just couldn't help himself. But I think that's quite dangerous. I saw an American um, lawyer talking about this, a senior American lawyer, um, and he said it might not affect how the trial goes, but when it comes to if he is found guilty, the judge has a range of options from a fine up to a prison sentence, and the insults that have been put his way by Donald Trump may affect how he, how he sees things. So I think he's walking a tightrope on this. And if I were him, I'd be advising, if his lawyers, uh, I'd be advising him to back down on this stuff, but Do I'm not sure he's capable of it. I mean, we were, there's not another court case now until December, which is a very yeah. long way away. Yeah. Then, if there is a trial, it'll be at the very earliest January. Yeah. We're into uh, the run-up to the elections mm. after that. If he's going to run, you know, he'll be, yeah. he'll be in court and also running to be president at the same time, potentially. I mean, it's a good question. First of all, his lawyers will use the next few months to basically try and get the case dismissed. And there are independent lawyers, not Trump supporters, independent lawyers in the American system, who have written that they think this case is really quite questionable. Um, and there is some quite novel legal theory behind what the prosecuting attorney is trying to do. And it may just not stick. Who knows? Um, and then, if they can't actually get it dismissed, 
then they will try every delaying tactic they can to get the hearing, to get the hearing now scheduled for December, put back and put back and put back. Um, and, you know, let's see what happens. Uh, will be their view on that. So can he I wouldn't guarantee it'll happen in, in... If he's president, can he appear in court? Um, I think that if he actually becomes president a second time uh, and you haven't had the hearing and you haven't had the, um, you know, uh, a verdict, I suspect it falls away, but I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. You need to... Well, we need to check... We've got plenty of those on later on, don't you? you worry, my lord. Um, was there anything that surprised you when the documents were unsealed? Um, uh, we'd heard that there might be as many as 30 different charges in it. In fact, there were 34. Um, uh, this case, or th this angle of this doorman who was paid off, was news, at least to me. Now, um, this was, as just so uh, if our viewers don't know, this was a doorman who apparently was given more than a, a, a significant amount of money, tens of, money, of thousands yes. of dollars, because he allegedly knew about a, a love child um, mm. that, born out of wedlock. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a second um, hush money case involving another, another lady um, which uh, hadn't come out beforehand. But all of the charges were basically uh, along the same lines, just lots of different cases of falsification of records. So there was nothing new there in terms of, you know, a big new charge that was going to break the whole thing open. And the overarching case is that misappropriation of monies uh, that could have influenced the 2016 election. Yeah. Um, I mean, what they are saying is that the records were falsified and the information was concealed in order to affect the outcome of the 2016 election. That's how you get from a misdemeanour, for which there's no prison sentence, to a felony. OK. Uh, what about his whataboutism? Um, in what sense? Oh, well, he was talking about... Uh, he was throwing mud everywhere, Biden particularly. Oh, yeah, but Biden that's on... just classic Trump, and he always does that, um, like there is some parallelism between what's happening to him and, you know, this, all this stuff about Hunter Biden's laptop and whatever, and basically there isn't. Um... What do you make of the fact that he wasn't handcuffed um, and um, he didn't have his mug shot taken? There was um, preferential treatment for the president. Yeah, there was, there was. But, I mean, if you look at why you would need a mug shot, I mean, this is the most recognisable individual on the planet, arguably, so I'm not sure they really needed it. I think King Charles might um, have something to say about uh, that. I think he was <laughs> fingerprinted. Um, he was, yeah. He was fingerprinted. But um, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable for them to make a few, a few um, concessions because it's an ex-president there. I mean, this is still, I promise you, Trump will hate every second of this because although he talks all the time about fake news, he cares profoundly, perhaps more about this than about anything else, about how he is seen in the rest of the world, in the media. And uh, all of this publicity, this global publicity, he will absolutely hate it. So it's uh, bad enough for him without him being photographed. But it looks as though Republican voters are lapping it up. He's doing stormingly well and raising millions of pounds for his campaign. What I noticed, Kay, when I was, when I was in Washington, and it's the same here, is opinion polls go up and down and, you know, the effect of an event on opinion polls lasts about two or three weeks and then things start to settle down again. So you're right, um, he has gone in a week and a half from eight points ahead of Ron DeSantis, who hasn't even yet declared yet, to 26 points ahead, and he seems to have raised about $10 million in money. And that all makes it look as if it's playing for him. But this is a very long game. We are nine months off the first primary and, uh, you know, a year and a half, more than a year and a half off the election. So let's see how this plays out and let's see whether those opinion polls stay as they are. And remember, this case, the Stormy Daniels case, is the first cab off the rank, but there are three more potential cases against him, all of which, if they, if they come to indictments, are much, much more serious. Yeah, I wonder why they went with this one. Um, it's just that, that this was the first... I mean, this Manhattan district attorney um, prepared his case. He's been, he's been researching it for a long time. And that's the way it works. Just happened to be the first one to come off. And they don't, they the don't kind of coordinate the documents themselves. in Mar Documents in Mar-a-Lago, the, the, the Georgia interference in the Georgia election, where, remember, Trump is recorded as having rung up the head of the election process well, in Georgia and say, tapes, find me 11, another 11,000 yeah, votes. 8, 000, yeah. And then a potential federal case about Trump's involvement, a potential incitement of 
the invasion of the capital on 6th January. Indeed. Just before I let you go, I mean, there's no love lost between the two of you, as we know. When you think about Donald Trump, um, you're back here in the UK, and you think about him, what memory comes into your mind? Um, inevitably, inevitably, his reaction when um, my, uh, my letter reporting, my classified letter reporting um, how he was doing came out, which was, I remember I was waiting for about 24 hours until, um, uh, and, until he was up playing golf in his course in, in, in New York, and I knew he would react, and there was, there was a fairly, you know, felt a long wait until he actually landed on the White House lawn, and um, then the journalists clustered around him, and then he said his remarks about um, uh, how lowly he rated me. Um, and, of course, you know, I knew from that moment on that basically I was going to have to resign. I was suspected I would because difficult to do the job after you've written about the president in that way. Uh, there were earlier moments, like when I took Theresa May in to see him um, as the first foreign visitor just a couple of days after his uh, inauguration, um, in which I saw a different side of Donald Trump. But it all ended like it ended. Fascinating stuff, my lord. Thank you for taking the time to join us. So